Good morning. Good morning. Brian Camp was asked by the Commonwealth about whether or not, or apparently he had uh, become involved in ev the evidence collection business um, when he took photos while he was engaged in a battle for his life and the life of his children and their mother. And thank goodness for a couple of minutes, Brian Camp was a self-employed evidence collector at the suggestion of the replacement of his father, his boss, the male figure who he called. And thank goodness for that because otherwise we would not have this photograph. I'm referring to exit, uh, exit, <laughs> I'm referring to exhibit 68. We would not have that photograph because there were no state police there. And the reason that photograph is important is because it has to be compared to exhibit number four, that photograph. <clears throat> and there was some, I forget if it was insinuation or if it was a direct question about keeping these photographs from the police or whatever. If you go back or when you go back and you look at his statement, ladies and gentlemen, you're going to see that at the end of his statement, they ask him if he will sign his phone over to them. These pictures were on his phone. He had taken them that night. The picture of Mr. Latender, if my memory serves, and by the way, my memory does not control, your collective memory controls. But my memory serves that that photograph was taken at 12.52 a.m. Um, and when asked, uh, I believe it was Trooper, no, it wasn't Trooper O'Brien, it was the, the cell phone uh, trooper. When asked if he had brought the rest of the photographs with him, uh, no, no, we didn't bring those. Uh, just the, the picture of the body for some sort of nefarious reason that Brian Camp would take a picture of Mr. Latender at this point in the attempted murder of Brian Camp. Uh, no, we didn't bother to bring those to show the jury. And so um, I presented him with what we have, which is uh, exhibit number 84, um, which is the series of pictures that Brian took that, that morning. That's what he took. Not just a picture of Mr. Latanya. So yes, he was engaged in evidence collection, thankfully. Uh, as was Ms. Samuelson, because um, the police weren't there when Mr. or when Brian took those pictures. With regard to the knife that wasn't found by the state police, they were there. They were at the house where that knife was ultimately found. And <clears throat> you'll hear, or you heard, um, the trooper, I believe it was O'Brien, say, when I asked him, well, what about the, the jacket? Didn't think it was important. It had no evidentiary value. There's a lot of stuff all over the house. Right now I'm referring to Exhibit 55. That's Exhibit 55, taken, the photograph taken by the police that night or that morning. There is his jacket right underneath a giant blood stain on the couch. How is that not important? <clears throat> Ms. Samuelson, thankfully, for a short period of time, is an evidence collection person, thankfully, because you're now able to see the knife that was brought by Mr. Latender. A knife that is being described by the Commonwealth uh, as decorative. Um, the only difference between being stabbed with that knife and being stabbed with a non-decorative knife 
is those pretty pictures on the decorative knife would have your blood all over them. That's the difference. That was brought by Mr. And that was missed. point before we get into circumstances. At some point during this battle for his life, Mr. Camp, there were ambulances staged nearby the house. Staged meaning held back because they couldn't go in until the state police arrived. There were ambulances there waiting. It is not my purview to do, uh, to say, uh, read anything about the jury instructions. Um, I'm going to hopefully be able to just uh, take a couple of phrases out because um, one of the things that uh, you're going to have to decide is whether or not Brian Camp um, should have, was um, properly using self-defense and that the amount of force that he used was appropriate under the circumstances. And, and circumstances is the word that popped out to me um, as I was looking at them yesterday because uh, there's one person in this building, there's one person I would suggest in this town, and I'll bet you there's only one person in this commonwealth that experienced what Brian Camp experienced that morning, the circumstances that he was dealing with. You're going to hear uh, the judge tell you regarding uh, four certain things that the Commonwealth must prove weren't there. Um, how the defendant acted under all the circumstances and how a reasonable person would do in the same circumstances. So I would just like to review those circumstances as I remember them. And again, your, uh, your memory controls, not mine. This was one event. This was one event that took place at 239 South Street. This was one event that was planned by Jonathan Latender. One event planned by Jonathan Latender to kill at least Brian Camp. An event that was planned by him, scheduled by him, and it happened on, in the early morning hours of the 27th of December, 2022. didn't reach Brian Camp's schedule, didn't reach those children's schedule. He scheduled for himself that this was the morning that he was going to kill somebody or everybody. And it was one event. It was one event that went from somewhere around 1235, because we have the 911 call, which is established at 1237. But that didn't happen right away. That, that call was made after Mr. Latender was in the bedroom and ended 19 minutes and some change later. That is the extent of the event. That seems like a very small amount of time in the grand scheme of things, but there's a reason why I asked certain people, have you, have you ever been in a fist fight? Have you ever had some sort of wrestling match with somebody for any extended period of time? This was an event that had all kinds of different circumstances happening uh, within. <clears throat> it was an event. All right, what do you think of Brian Camp's attorney? Hit us up on social media, let us know. There's more to the defense closing arguments right after this. Welcome back to Court TV Live. I'm Julie Grant. We're going to go back to Massachusetts together in just a couple of minutes as we're covering the jealous ex shot dead trial. We're in the closing arguments uh, per the Commonwealth rules. The defense goes first. The Commonwealth goes last. So we're seeing Brian Camp's uh, defense attorney go first here. Now, while that's happening, I want to let you know about another major courtroom hearing happening today. There's interest all around the country in this one, the case of the Menendez brothers. They murdered their parents 
They've done over 30 years in prison, and now they're going to be before a judge today. We've got a status conference on this habeas corpus petition that their attorneys have filed. What they want is reconsideration of some evidence that these they say is new. Uh, there's a letter that Eric wrote to a relative that they claim supports the brother's claims of child abuse uh, at the hands of their father, Jose. And there's also some information coming from an outside source, one of the boy band members and the band Menudo, uh, willing to come forward and say that he was molested by Jose Menendez. But what does that have to do with freeing the brothers? Well, the attorneys for these guys are gonna try to make that argument today in the courtroom. Our cameras are excluded from filming, but we have a Court TV representative who will be there. We will report on every detail that happens as these brothers try to become free, free after being sentenced to life in prison when they could have had the death penalty. Now, let's return to Massachusetts. We're watching the Jealous X Shot Dead trial. Let's go back in for more of the closings there. There, who knows when. But as far as we know, when he parked, he hid his car up the hill in the middle of the night past the house, up the hill, so people inside would not see him coming. It continued this event for him when he walked up to the door. And of course, we don't know exactly what door it is. The, the state police are assuming it was the front door, but we'll give that to them. Let's say it's the front door. He walks up, Mr. Latender walks up to the front door. This event for him is continuing, and he walks up to the front door, and he gains entrance to the house where Mr. Camp Brian Camp is asleep, Brooke Janik is asleep, two little girls are asleep. Let's himself in the house, and he takes his shoes off. And ladies and gentlemen, picture this moment. The evidence has shown, circumstantially, that there was a moment in this morning where Jonathan Latender stood at the bottom of those stairs. with his shoes off, clearly intending to kill someone. And he started walking up those stairs. Not to be known until something made a noise. You'll see that those stairs are wood, probably a creek, I don't know. This was an event that started for Brian Camp shortly after Mr. Latender got to the top of the stairs. And here's how it started for Mr. Camp, seeing a silhouette of a guy who we now know is six feet tall, 190 pounds, in his bedroom, and sets on Brian Camp almost immediately. Brian Camp is scrunched up as you are is, is scrunched up to the end of his bed as he's trying to get up and figure out what's going on and this guy gets on him with his knees and grabs him by his throat and is choking him and slams his head into the wall that's the introduction of brian camp to this event planned by jonathan latender an event that took place for 19 minutes and change now for mr for brian camp that's the introduction. Criticism of and second guessing of decision making by Brian Camp throughout the, the 19 minutes and after. I'm pretty sure there's no like manual that was ever drawn up on how to make decisions when this is going on. As a 22 year old man who is five foot nine, 145 pounds, is set upon by a very large man, well-developed. And the scariest part is not on drugs. He has no alcohol in his system. This happened without any help. This man was set on killing at least Brian Camp. All right, we're going to pause this right here. I, I, you know I like to be totally transparent with you always, my friends. If you've noticed 
the sound on your TV or your phone, wherever you're watching, kind of going up at certain points. This attorney is putting his legal pad close to the microphones we have positioned, so that's why a little bit of extra noise is happening there. It's not within our control, but just wanted to let you know where it's coming from, in case you're wondering. But let's talk about the advocacy, if we can. I, I'm going to be totally honest. I think this attorney has the facts entirely on his side, but his advocacy is lacking something from me. I think it's pretty lackluster for a closing argument. It's just my opinion. Let me bring in my legal analyst guest to get his opinion, Franz Borghardt, watching along. All right, Franz, give it to us straight here. What do you think? So there are a few times that a criminal defense attorney gets to have self-righteous indignation, right? It, to be, to be, to be on the side of justice, and to be, you can be indignant, you can be angry. All these things in this closing would be appropriate. All these things, look, my position is this so-called victim went on a suicide mission and found what he was looking for. However, this this criminal defense attorney, I, I you, you're putting it nicely, lackluster, um, it's kind of, it's kind of, uh, maybe he's warming up, maybe he's gonna get there, but man, oh man, do I relish the opportunity to thump my chest and, and be indignant and to be on the side of, of, of justice in the sense of a self-defense case where you clearly have self-defense and you're absolutely right. He has the facts, right? That Not a dis fact in dispute. This guy is in a place that he's not supposed to be. He's fueled not by alcohol, not by drugs. He's fueled by malice intent. This guy's not going in there to give camp a hug. He's not going in there to shake his hand and pat him on the butt. He's going in there to harm him. So hopefully he'll build it up. But look, even if he doesn't, even if he doesn't, I, I still am optimistic that the jury's gonna do the right thing on this one. Right, right, Franz. They might be bored to tears with this guy, but yet they know the facts. Exactly. And, and I love what you said. There, there are few cases like this that you're going to run into as a criminal defense attorney. I mean, if I were him, I would have started by saying Brian Camp is a hero. This case is about a jilted ex-lover who broke in in the middle of the night into his sacrosanct space. And he defended himself and his family members of the jury. Send him home. You know, that, like, that instead, this guy starts by by saying Brian Camp was asked by the Commonwealth about whether he'd become in the evidence collection business by taking photographs when when he shot this man. Like, what what kind of an opening line is that in your closing argument? I I I'm just I'm I'm horrified. Uh, okay, I, I'm being told we got to wrap here. Uh, Franz, stand by, please. We're gonna hit a break. We'll go right back in for some more uh, advocacy after this. On Court TV. I'm Vinny Politan. Welcome to Closing Arguments. We have a big hour ahead here. Your deplorable actions are unforgivable. The community still doesn't know how this Boston police officer died. He can't prove one element of his case. It was a dramatic day, a dramatic moment inside the courtroom. What's happening here? It's uh, unreal. Let me show you exactly what happened. Closing Arguments with Vinny Politan. Tonight at 8, 7 Central. Only on Court TV. Why didn't you shoot him with the muzzle loader? I was not trying to shoot anybody. What did you want him to do? I wanted him to get out of the house. And each time that he was given an opportunity, what would he do? Opportunity to leave the house, what would he do? He would not take the opportunity and then charge right towards me talking about the intruder right there, the decedent in this case, who the Commonwealth believes has been victimized. They have put the homeowner on trial here. Brian Camp on trial, accused of the crime of manslaughter. His attorney's delivering his closing arguments. Let's go in live. And away he went. And so these circumstances begin. And in the bedroom, ladies and gentlemen, you start to see how the circumstances sort of uh, start to pile up with regard to what's happening to, to Brian Camp and what's happening or not happening to Mr. Latender. And those are important with regard to what happens later on with regard to uh, use of force and self-defense and a statement given at the police station later on. He has jumped, his head is slammed into the wall, 
it breaks the wall. He's being choked. And Mr. Latender gets eventually smashed on the head with something glass. Brian Camp is under attack, and he is immediately physically under attack. And, you know, there's the constant, we've, we've had the constant mention of the fact that he was naked the entire time. And really the import of that is the, I mean, imagine the vulnerability of that moment when you are in your own bed and you have no clothes on and this guy is trying to kill you. And there's no clothes for the entire time. And it's important that the smash on the head of Mr. Latender did nothing. Maybe loosened his grip for a second because Brian was able to get out and get behind Mr. Latender and try to choke him out with the, the rear naked choke around his neck and to, uh, to show the difference in size of the two gentlemen, specifically with regard to the fight itself or the attack. He gets behind Mr. Latender and on his feet actually is able to get his arm around his neck. But that is not long lived, ladies and gentlemen, because all Mr. Latender has to do is this and Brian's feet are up off the ground, hanging on, riding this guy, trying to end this thing. He's trying to end this thing, but Mr. Latender is not gonna have anything to do with ending this thing until someone is dead. They both fall. You'll see, you've seen, or you, and you will see the linoleum area where there, where there is blood. Mr. Latender is now bleeding and getting it all over in his mouth and in his body, Mr. Camp. And the fight continues, and Mr. Camp is fighting for his life on the side, still trying to choke him. Mr. Latender cannot be stopped. This is where we see that Mr. Latender cannot and will not be stopped because he is fighting from in front. He's fighting Brian behind him. He's grabbing for things, feels his eyes, and then, as Brian described to you, stuck a finger or two fingers between his eyeball and his eye socket. If you've ever had your eye poked, Mr. Latender is, is, is not going to be stopped until somebody is dead. The circumstances continue, ladies and gentlemen. <clears throat> Brian is able to escape after almost having his eyeballs ripped out. And he runs downstairs. And he runs downstairs uh, for a couple reasons. He runs downstairs to get this guy away from his children. And if there is criticism, I forget if there was criticism about that, but imagine trying to get two little girls out of their room at this point in this attack. He went downstairs, the safest place for those girls were in their room with the door closed, and he used himself as bait as Mr. Latender chased him down, chased him down the stairs. Where there is an open door, that Brian allows him access to. You heard that he grabs the muzzle loader, that's that uh, silver gun, and he turns himself and backs himself into the living room. Well, this guy comes down right there. He doesn't get the F out. He's not interested in getting the F out. He comes forward towards Brian Camp with this muzzle loader in his hand and is strong enough to grab the barrel of the gun and yank it out of Brian's hands. And then starts trying to pull the trigger. As it's pointed at Brian. Brian recognizes this guy does not know how this gun works, thankfully, and actually positions himself again in a way to try to neutralize this guy. The guy still is trying to pull the trigger and Brian pops whatever you gotta pop on a muzzle loader, opens it up and the primer, which is the thing that makes the bullet shoot, falls out onto the ground. Brian now knows that that gun is neutralized, that, the, that that can only be used 
like the next shotgun is going to be used, but that is now on the ground, and the two of them fall onto the ground. Meanwhile, punches are being thrown by each of these guys, and if there was ever any doubt about what Mr. Latender's plan was here, They fall to the ground, both of them, and Brian gets another short-lived advantage. And you can hear on the 911 call, ladies and gentlemen, it's sort of a play-by-play -play of this whole thing as it goes along. Obviously, you can't hear everything, but you can hear as it goes along what is happening here. And in this part, you, you hear Brooke Janik say, <clears throat> Something to the effect of Brian has him on the ground. We're hitting the pause button. You won't miss a minute of the closing arguments. We'll be back live in Massachusetts after this. So grateful for your company on this Monday morning. Welcome to our second hour of Court TV Live. I'm Julie Grant. We've got four major trials we are tracking for you today. We've got closing arguments in the manslaughter trial of Brian Camp. We'll go back there in just a moment. We're also counting down to a big hearing for the Menendez brothers later today in California. Court TV will be there. They're going to be there virtually, but we've got a representative in person. We'll let you know everything that happens as these killers are pushing for freedom. In Kentucky, we've got former Sheriff Mickey Stein's going to be in court. He was just indicted by a grand jury. He'll be in court at noon today. And in Florida, we've got Susan Lawrence's sentencing scheduled for 1.30 p.m. Eastern time. Now, let's go back to Massachusetts. We're hearing Brian Camp's attorney deliver his final arguments to the jury. And he did. And if you remember his testimony, he had him sort of standing over him, trying to control his hands in this fight. He's on his back. Right above where they are is his jacket. And he's trying to control his hands long enough for the police to come. And this guy on his back is able to fight back from the floor and then in another example of his strength versus Brian Camp from the floor is able to push his hands up and his legs up and Brian is now lifted with him and onto the couch. I'm not surprised that Mr. Latender wanted to get onto the couch. That's why there's blood at that on that pillow. With his jacket right here. With the knife that the state police didn't find. Fortunately, and actually you hear Brooke say, I'm going further outside because Jonathan just got up. So he gets off of the couch and he's back up again. Brian now goes to the closet where there is this, hard to call it a shotgun, but he grabs this gun again points it at him. Again, as with the muzzle loader, he comes forward. He's not backing up. He's not saying, okay, bud, let me go. You know what? This is enough. I'm going to go out the door. I made a mistake. He comes forward, pours the shotgun, grabs the shotgun. It breaks in two, and now they each have a weapon. If this wasn't a manslaughter trial, this would almost be funny. So it would almost be a, a funny cartoon situation where the gun breaks and now they're both looking at each other. And Latender starts whacking away, as does Brian Camp. And they're whacking away at each other because Mr. Latender wants to kill Brian Camp. And Brian Camp wants to live long enough for the police to show up, for the ambulances to arrive.
And the best way he knows at that point, despite the fact that this guy just will not stop at this point, is with what he's got in his hand. And you hear that, again, he actually, it sounds like Brian had a little bit of an advantage in this situation because Latender is backing up as they're whacking each other, and then Brian says he hits him over the head with the stock, and the stock breaks, which gives him a shorter weapon, he says, this is no good. And does that stop Mr. Latender? No. And I'd invite you to, to look at the injuries on Mr. Latender's head. He's got some pretty significant injuries on his head, the back of his head. He's got cuts, he's got <clears throat> gash. None of that stopped him. None of that was going to stop him. And so Brian starts backing up. And again, criticism of decisions made by Brian Camp under these circumstances. There's, there's a reasonable person part of this. What would a reasonable person do in this situation? Brian Camp, I would suggest to you, ladies and gentlemen, is focused on this guy who is intent to kill him as he's backing up. The fact that he passes a revolver on the left-hand side, he's focusing on this guy. This guy is coming at him. Imagine trying to figure out the speed of what's going on. I would imagine, based on uh, uh, common life experience, common sense and life experience, which you get to use back in the jury room, you would imagine that this is taking forever, probably going in slow motion, like, Brian's still trying to figure out what's going on. Who is this guy? And he's coming at me with this thing, and I got a gun up there and pulls it down with his left hand because his right hand is broken. You see pictures of it. You heard him talk about it. A boxer's fracture speaks for itself, I would assume. And as this guy is closing, fires a shot. If this was a situation where Brian Camp wanted to kill someone, if this was a situation where Brian Camp intended to want to kill someone or that this was going to be some sort of retribution killing or revenge killing, or that he wanted to shoot someone, that he wanted to shoot someone, which he didn't, or that he wanted someone to die, he would have gone like this. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. He shot once and got out. And down falls Mr. Latender. These are the circumstances that Mr. that Brian Camp was in, where he is required to make decisions, literally life and death decisions. <clears throat> All the while, Mr. Latender, just making sure. To this point, Brian Camp has been choked, punched, head slammed into his own bedroom wall, knelt upon, fallen down to the floor with this guy uh, in the battle, both upstairs and downstairs. He's got a broken hand. He's had to wrestle for a gun for his life. And imagine the psychological effect on the fact that this guy has the end of a gun in Brian's gut trying to pull the trigger. Imagine how exhausting physically and mentally at this point. And this lasts for seven minutes and 43 seconds, that fight. He's got the kids to think upstairs, think about upstairs. He's got Brooke, who's outside, talking to the state police. Still no state police. Brian knows the police are coming. 
Brian wants the police to come. He knows they're coming. He wants them to come there to end this. He's not going to do a revenge killing, a retribution killing. Take pictures of it. When he knows and wants the state police to please arrive, maybe Chesterfield. Could Chesterfield please arrive to end this thing? He's got an injured knee. You see the picture. He is getting the you-know-what beat out of him the entire way. Any sort of advantage that he got physically goes away very quickly because Mr. Latender overpowers him with his size and whatever it is that is driving him to want to kill Brian Camp. And he's been smashed over the head, Brian, with a gun barrel as well. And I suggest to you, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to get to, when we get to the statement, you're going to hear, if you remember, or if you watch it again, his statement, you're going to hear the state trooper say, you've been through a traumatic experience. Shooting someone is a traumatic experience. Shooting someone under these conditions is a traumatic experience. Mr. Latender is down on the floor on his back. And you heard that he was uh, moving around. Whether it was writhing or not, he was able to move around. And I suggest to you that in Exhibit 68, you can see that there's evidence of his movement there, both with, well, <clears throat> Not necessarily with his hand where it is. There's movement. We learn about that later on with the second picture. But this blood swatch right here, that crescent shape, his hand went through his own blood and put his head on top, a hand on top of his head. He's moving. His leg is in a an L shape there, his right leg. And he is telling Brian Camp now. And there was questioning to Brian Camp. You mean he meant you needed a lawyer? And Brian said, no. He said he needed a lawyer. Because of the multiple felonies that this guy has already committed and is continuing to commit. <clears throat> He's on the floor. He is still near the gun barrel, which is right next to him. He is near the revolver that is up on the cabinet or counter. He is near the set of knives which are on the counter as he lay there <clears throat> threatening to kill Brian Camp while he's moving. Brian now had, like, okay, this guy is at least down on the ground, but he is still a threat, threatening to kill me. He's moving. Are the police here? No. So he starts to do whatever you got to do when someone is trying to kill you in your house for seven minutes and 43 seconds, and now the event has slowed, hasn't stopped. The event has slowed, I would suggest to you. Let's start with putting some clothes on. Like, that's where he's been during this entire time. And, again, criticism of a 22-year-old guy under these conditions, under these circumstances, as the judge is going to tell you. There are cars out in the in the driveway. You had the keys to them. Why didn't you take the kids out and go 
and, and drive, drive them away. Appears that that so far has been the safest place for them. To bring them out into this situation, I think, would be the bigger mistake. He made the right decision. And anyway, the police are going to be here any minute, so... Yes, he took a picture of me. Closing arguments isn't about bringing up every little detail in the story. No, it's a time to convince the jury why you win the case. Argument why you should win on the facts that they already know. We're going to hit pause. You're going to see the rest of this attorney's closing arguments right after the break. We want to understand the mindset behind your actions in this case. Tell me, why are you here? She needed payback. Payback with her life? Very funny, really. I'm laughing. Did you see me? I left. I don't want any of this. Are you not prepared today to take responsibility for any of your crimes? <laughs> Interview with a killer. Marathon starting Thursday, 1110 Central. Only on Court TV. Back inside the courtroom, we're watching the all-important closing arguments in the jealous ex shot dead trial. Let's go back in and hear more from defendant Brian Camp's lawyer. The picture of the other places, or the other things, his children's bedroom door, to show you how close to his door it was where this guy broke in. The wall, you know, again, he's in evidence collection at that point, but he just sees that his handprint and blood is on the wall, so I better get a picture of that the broken stuff in the room. He's trying to manage the situation, knowing the police are coming. Any minute, listen to the dispatcher tell Brooke. They'll be there any time now. They should be there. We've sent them to you. They should be there any time. And really, there's not any one, I'm not, there's no criticism against any one officer. But this system, man, holy mackerel. Like, they're following what they're supposed to follow, apparently, and this is the result. Which lends itself to what ultimately happens in this case, which is not a revenge killing. He knows the police are coming. He wants the police to come. He is doing what he's doing with the knowledge of that and with the hope of that. He wants this to end with the intervention of the police and the ambulance to show up again. But they're not going to be there for a while still, ladies and gentlemen. <clears throat> he does not leave the house. He goes out to the deck. That's as far as he goes. There were questions to him about leaving the house. He and he jumped on and said, you know, on the deck. He has his girls upstairs. He's got this guy who was trying to kill people in his kitchen. And he's got, hopefully, police on the way. And he shot a guy. What do you think is starting to happen to somebody's psychology with all of this stuff going on? A 22-year-old guy who was asleep seven minutes and 50 seconds before. Sound asleep. And you know that he was shot in the left eye. And we heard from the Commonwealth Medical Examiner with regard to the injury. And I'm far from a doctor and your memory uh, rules are not mine, but we know what the injury was about because there was, as this case began, that this guy was incapacitated as a result of being shot. Oh, no. No, no. 750 milliliters of blood in his body cavity. We learned that that is the very beginning of what's called level two hemorrhagic uh, shock. Very end of level one, beginning of level two. 15% of his blood body. Symptoms of level two hemorrhagic shock are anxiety, 
and pain. Anxiety and pain. This guy now, whatever he's got going on in his head, now has anxiety added to it. And I started asking uh, or, or questioning the, the, um, the medical examiner about his ability to move. And we made it clear that yes, he could talk and he could certainly move his arms and he could move his legs. And then he started volunteering about this guy being able to get up on his feet and try to say that, ah, that wasn't gonna happen. But everybody's got a different tolerance of pain, correct, Judge? I mean, correct, uh, Doctor? Yeah, everybody's tolerance of pain is different. Anxiety, yep. Adrenaline, yep. Pain tolerance is different for every person. We know what Mr. Latender's tolerance for pain was. And it was very high. Again, look at the photos of his head. Smashed glass on his head, choked from behind, punched either so hard or so frequently by Brian Camp that Brian Camp's hand broke. None of that stopped him. Knocked to the ground twice, hit in the head with a gun stock. The response to that was to come forward against Brian Camp after being hit in the head with a gun stock. Multiple times. None of that stopped him. His tolerance of pain, for pain is very clear. It seems astronomical. Surely, Commonwealth wanted us to believe that he was incapacitated, not this guy. So now we have these circumstances set up where Brian is doing what he can best decide to do under these circumstances. The photograph he took of Mr. Latender is not up close. Right in the beginning, somebody went like this and said he snapped the picture like that. You've seen it, or if you haven't seen it, you can see it. It is from distance, because Brian wants nothing to do with this guy at this point. Brooke is outside. Kids are upstairs. No police. No hint of police, no estimate of when they're going to be there uh, to these guys. And Brian is doing what he thinks he has to do, waiting for them. And then at 1240 of the 911 call, we hear the dispatcher start talking about Brian and checking on Jonathan. And I cross examined her about that. And again, Nothing personal against that person. She now is struggling because the state police are nowhere to be found in her job. And so here's what happens starting at 1240 of the 911 call. And these are estimates by me around 1240. The dispatcher says to Brooke, what is going on with Jonathan right now? Brooke says, I don't know, I'm outside. Dispatcher says, where is Brian right now? Brooke says, I don't know. Dispatcher says, did Brian just come back outside? Brooke says, he was popping in and out of the door because the door is open and he wanted to calm me down. Dispatcher, I just want to know what Brian is doing right now. I don't want you to go in the house, the dispatcher says to Brooke. Brooke says to Brian, what are you doing right now? And this is where you hear that there is this relay. Brian can sometimes hear, but Brooke is relaying the messages to, to, to Brian. He's putting clothes on. He was naked until now. And at 1317, not, not as much of what he, she says, but the way she says it and stops herself. At 1317, the dispatcher says to Brooke, once Brian puts his clothes on, the very next question, three seconds later, 
What is Jonathan's status? Do you know? Brooke yells to Brian. What is Jonathan's status? Brian says, he's laying there moaning. The dispatcher says, ask Brian if Jonathan has a gunshot wound. Brian says, you can hear Brian say, he most definitely does. Brooke says, yes, he does. The dispatcher says, I want you and Brian to exit the home. Dispatcher says, are you and Brian outside? Brooke says, he's getting his shoes, I believe, and I don't have shoes on. She doesn't say, get Brian out of there. She says, can you ask Brian where in the body he shot Jonathan? He's right there at the door. He doesn't want me to come up to it. Brooke says to Brian, where on the body did you shoot him? to do with going near this guy. Brooke says, 1415, they need to know. Dispatcher says, can you just ask him? Brooke says, I think he's looking. At 1440, Brooke asked Brian again, where did you shoot him? Brian says, I don't know, Brooke. He doesn't want to go in there. And I believe you can hear him say, I didn't examine it. No doubt this was an incredibly stressful and traumatic situation for Brian Camp. Is his attorney conveying this to the jury in the best way that he could? In other words, is his storytelling effective? Let me bring in law enforcement expert Sunny Slaughter. She's our law enforcement analyst today watching along remotely. Good morning, Sunny. Curious what you think of the defense advocacy going on here. Good morning, Julie. You know, I love being on with you and happy Thanksgiving week to everyone. Absolutely not. I am infuriated. Uh, as you stated earlier, you know, I've been watching the guys early this morning. What, what is happening here with this defense attorney? Listen, this is a case of self-defense. He was naked. The uninvited guest came to the home. He was not invited. He attacked me when I was asleep. I was naked. I was defending my family. What is it that the defense attorney is not getting conveyed? It's just a clear and simple fact. He doesn't need to go through all of this. He could have sat down a long time ago. He had a good witness. The witness was strong on the stand. The evidence is clear. He did everything he needed to do to protect his family. And all of this other stuff is really not necessary because I believe, and I think most other other people would agree that the evidence is on the side of the person who has been accused of not defending himself in the way that the prosecution wanted him to do. This is a waste of time. Get to it. He's defended himself. He doesn't need to relive all of these things. Right, right, Sonny, exactly. It's wasting the <laughs> jury's time. I, I couldn't agree with you more. It's time for him to sit down. You know, it, it, this is a golden opportunity, as you noted, for him to argue these facts that are on his side. And, and I've been reading all the comments, and thank you all at home for sending them in as, as you're reacting the same way we are, saying, what's going on? This advocacy is, is, is really lackluster. It, it is not sharp advocacy, and it could be. Uh, Sonny, you do some... Yeah jury consulting work and litigation uh, advisement work. Let's say you were sitting in the courtroom and you're watching that. Um, let's just say the judge calls for a break and you get to say to the defense attorney some advice on what to do when you go back. <laughs> what would you tell him? Uh, I'm going to tell you him. Um, first of all, you sound weak like you're not winning and you are winning. You need to be strong, you need to be stern. You need to like hit the quick points and then have a seat so the jury can like 
let's go. The jury has already awfully made up their mind because the jury of public opinion, we have made up their mind. This is not a winnable case for the prosecution, but I think the dragging out by the defense is, is just, and I would just tell him, let me give you the key points. I just need you to say those, and then I need you to sit down exactly. because this is not necessary. That's exactly. what I need you to do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, I love that advice. Look, like, get, get some oomph with you because right. you know that? Like, you're, you're sounding like a little weak and you're like strong. Come on, dude. Like, get, do you need, I would say, do you need me to do this for you? Just not yeah, just no. <laughs> Get in there, Sonny. <laughs> we need you to get in there, my friend. I know. Oh, my gosh. Stand by kindly, please. We're going to hit a break because we're at the bottom of the hour. When we come back, we're going back in exactly at the point where we left off. We pause the testimony so you won't miss a minute of it. Thanks for being with us here on Court TV Live. Brian Camp is under attack, and he is immediately physically under attack. And, you know, there's the constant, we've, we've had the constant mention of the fact that he was naked the entire time. And really the import of that is the, I mean, imagine the vulnerability of that moment when you are in your own bed and you have no clothes on and this guy is trying to kill you. Oh, now walking the line right there. On the other side, the prosecution could have objected, uh, arguably for a golden rule violation. You can't ask the members of the jury to put themselves in the shoes of one of the parties, the defendant or the victim. Uh, but there was no objection. So uh, it came in. Maybe the prosecution isn't worried. Maybe because this advocacy is so lackluster. Let's go back in. We hit pause, go right back in where we left off. Brian outside with you right now? No. I asked him where he shot him and he wasn't sure. What's he doing right now? He's back inside. Sixteen twenty. Oh my God, I heard another shot. The dispatcher says, you heard another gunshot? Brooke says, yes, where are you guys? They're on their way, says the dispatcher, and they don't show up for another two and a half minutes. Didn't want to go near this guy. State police asked him to go near this guy. He goes at their request, and you heard him tell you what happened. This guy, who has done nothing but try to kill Brian Camp, is in his kitchen with this tolerance of pain. I mean, obviously, Brian didn't know about hemorrhagic shock and all that kind of stuff, but he's going in to check on his status for the state police and as Brian says, he comes around the corner and this guy is getting up. Nothing is stopping this guy. And you saw how Brian said it happened. He saw him and boom. This guy was going to kill Brian Camp even after he was shot. <clears throat> Was it reasonable for Brian to think that's what was going to happen at that point? I think so. It's that the only evidence that there was was that that was what was happening. And you, you'll be able to see, ladies and gentlemen, that the reason the photo that Brian took, I mean, they're all important, but that's important because that was the position that he had left them in. And this is a picture of Mr. Latender by police when they arrived. And look at the positioning of his arms and how close that gun barrel was to him and where that revolver was and where the knives were. Brian Camp had tried every means during this event to avoid this guy 
to, to, to get him out of his house. He couldn't avoid the first attack. He couldn't avoid the first attack because he was just getting up and this guy was on him and choking him and slamming his head. But when he came to and he had the opportunity, the first thing he does when he goes downstairs is points a gun at him and says, get out. And he doesn't get out, comes at him. And again, ladies and gentlemen, when you look at the photographs again, when they were hitting each other over the head and Mr. Latender was backing up, he backed up to a place where he was against the uh, dining room slider and that open door was straight over there still. And he didn't leave. He came at Brian Camp. He had tried every conceivable way to not do this. He had tried every conceivable way with his fists, by choking him, by feigning that he was going to shoot him twice, by hitting him over the head with things. And he was trying to avoid going near him again when at 12.40 of the 911 call, the dispatcher says, hey, where's Brian? And where's Jonathan? Can somebody check on him? Can you ask him where he shot him? Where did you shoot him? I don't know. I didn't examine it. it, it he went in not because he wanted to go in. He went in because he was requested by the state police dispatcher. This is not a, a revenge situation. This is not a, a place where he wanted to be. This guy was getting up to the surprise of Brian Camp and was getting up near that barrel, near that gun, and nothing else had stopped this guy. And by the way, this is not a situation where the Commonwealth wants you to believe that he walked up to him. And as I said in my opening, and as we heard, one of the first things was back of the head. It's not the back of the head. It's not an execution. It's the top of his head from this side where the last thing that and apparently the Commonwealth wants Brian Camp after all of this in his own home to get closer to Mr. Latender and I believe why didn't you kick him in the head or we're hitting the pause button I'm being told we need to take a break we'll be right back live after this we want to understand the mindset behind your actions in this case tell me why are you here she needed Payback. Payback with her life. Very funny, really. I have left. And you see me, I left. I don't want any of this. Are you not prepared today to take responsibility for any of your crimes? <laughs> Interview with a killer. Marathon starting Thursday, 1110 Central. Only on Court TV. Call now. Thanks for being with us on this Monday morning. We're going to go back to Massachusetts in just a moment for the jealous ex shot dead trial. But first, a little reminder we want to give to you that the Menendez brothers will be in court this afternoon. Attorneys for Eric and Lau Menendez are going to be asking the judge to reconsider the convictions of the two killer brothers. This hearing is set for 1.30 p.m. Eastern time. Uh, the brothers in on sentences of life without parole for the murders of their parents, Jose and Kitty Menendez. Those killings happened back in 1989. And we will have someone from Court TV in the courtroom, even though our cameras have been excluded. And they'll be reporting back on everything we learned today. Uh, this is a petition to reconsider some new pieces of evidence, a letter that Eric Menendez wrote to a family member, supposedly, and claims from a member of the boy band Menudo that could corroborate the brother's claims of sexual abuse. Now, that's coming up this afternoon for you here on Court TV. Right now, we're returning to Massachusetts for more of the Jealous X Shot Dead trial. Stomp him on the throat. Because none of that was working. None of that had worked, and this guy is not being stopped by a gunshot. He's getting up. We now know why from the medical examiner. The only thing this guy was doing was trying to kill Brian Camp. 
The injuries and the exhaustion of Brian Camp at that point, too. So I'm going to go over closer to him and whatever, kick him and stomp him. Where I've already gotten my you-know-what kicked the entire time. I am. My dominant hand is injured. My knee is hurt. My head is ringing. My eyes are poked. There was no stippling, as you heard. There was no gun impression. There was no gunpowder. It was from distance to stop this guy from killing him. The last subject that I'm going to touch on here, ladies and gentlemen, is the statement that Brian gave. And the judge already instructed you originally about statements and voluntariness and stuff, the humane practice. He told the operator, he told the 911 operator that he fired a second shot. Close in time to when it happened, right after this encounter with this guy. He told him that. He now, between the end of this ordeal, and by the way, state police still not there. Ambulance is still not there. They don't arrive for two and a half more minutes. And here we are left. But after that, now Brian is the suspect. And between the time that he is taken off of the ground with his gun and he is brought to the barracks for this statement, you get to use your common sense and life experience as to what happens to a person under these circumstances. What happens to your brain after it's been slammed against the wall? What happens to your brain when it's been smashed by being punched or hit in the head with a gun barrel? When your eyes are gouged, when you are exhausted, when you hit your head on the floor when you fall, you did that downstairs. When you have a boxer's fracture to your right hand, your dominant hand is no longer good. He's got a busted knee, and now he is sitting in an ambulance. He starts in the cruiser, and then he sits in an ambulance. And the person that Brian Camp is, is the person who says, nope, I'm going to stay here so I can see my kids in the ambulance, and they don't let him see his kids. That would have an effect. He just shot somebody. That would have an effect. The trooper says, you've just had a traumatic experience. About four hours, I believe the math is that he sits in the ambulance. They don't let him see his kids. Time goes by. Whatever is going on with his body, which I would suggest to you is only more and more pain. He finally goes to the, the, the hospital where he is treated. He's not given pain medication, and then they take him to the barracks. And when you pay close attention to um, the judge's instruction, the humane practice judge's instruction, the things that you take into consideration about a statement that is given by somebody um, to the police conditions and their condition, I just want to reiterate something for transparency. When you hear those little spikes in the audio, the defense attorney is getting his legal pad close to the microphone. We place our microphones around the courtroom so we can hear the audio. And when he turns the pages there, it makes that rumbling sound. So that's what that is. Uh, we're so glad you're watching along with us at home. I'm going to bring in our law enforcement guests for some final thoughts before we hit a break. Sonny Slaughter, okay, uh, so earlier you said... You would say that this attorney, look, you're sounding weak. You're going into too much detail. Wrap it up, sit down. Uh, what are your thoughts now about 25 minutes later? Uh, wrap it up and sit down. <laughs> Still, <laughs> I'm just, you know, 
I, I, I was wondering if he has had a case like this before mm -hmm. or if he actually watches court TV. Um, you know, a lot of defense attorneys and those watch court TV, which uh, actually kind of helps in their cases. I, I just really think that this case was settled a long time ago. And I hope that him dragging it out is not compromising what we already all believe to be is a not guilty uh, verdict. Uh, that's what I'm hoping for. I will continue to watch all day long and hope that this resolution comes quickly because he is not making it any better, I think, with this long drawn out uh, scenario that we've already heard. And the evidence is on his side. So I think when he's taking too much time to do this, when you are already winning, take the win, sit down quickly, and let's get to the actual uh, verdict of this trial. Right, and Sunny, in your experience, jurors want to be convinced, right? They want to be convinced that they're making the right decision. And so it's just like, I, I want to say, come on, buddy, convince them, convince them of, of what we seem to be already convinced of. Oh my goodness, yes, uh, he's not go. done yet. Yeah, <laughs> he's still going. Uh, Sonny Slaughter, we gotta hit this break. Uh, thank you so much for your time and expertise and happy Thanksgiving to you and yours as well, Fred. When we come back, you're gonna see the remainder of the defense closing argument. You won't miss a minute of it. Thank you for watching Court TV Live. We are your front row seat to justice. Hot Tom. Welcome back to Court TV Live. I'm Ted Rollins. Good to have you along with us on this holiday week as we kick off our coverage. Several trials across the country today. You know, then you think it's Thanksgiving week. There's nothing going on. Oh, oh, there's tons going on. We're in Massachusetts. Soon be on verdict watch in the jealous X shot dead trial for Brian Camp. We'll head back for more of the closings in just a minute. In Kentucky, the arraignment hearing for Sean Steins gets underway next hour. He, of course, is that sheriff charged with killing the judge, Judge Kevin Mullins, in the judge's chambers. And in California, Lyle and Eric Menendez set to appear in court 1.30 p.m. Eastern for the latest step in their bid for release. Also, we're in Florida. The sentencing hearing for Susan Lorenz begins 1.30 Eastern as well. A jury found her guilty of manslaughter for shooting and killing her neighbor, A.J. Owens, while the victim was standing outside the defendant's locked front door. She faces up to 30 years in prison. For now, though, let's head back to Massachusetts in the manslaughter case for Brian Kep. We're picking up the defense clothes right where we left off. You'll see, well, first of all, they say traumatic experience, something to the effect of, you know, more things will come back to you as time goes by. He says, I'm having trouble lining up, and I forget if it's A, B, C, or one, two, three, but he's saying I'm having trouble lining that up. You can tell as this statement is going on, the state police are in communication with somebody else, probably at the scene. And Brian is sitting there, by the way, picking Jonathan Latender's blood off of his face as he's sitting there. They wouldn't have, let him have water in the ambulance. They wouldn't let him wash his face off as he's sitting there. You'll see it if you didn't see it already. He's sitting there with this guy's blood on him in the, in the barracks when he's being questioned about what just happened. They know, ladies and gentlemen, you can hear they start to get information from the 911 call. They know he has said already, he told them. They know he has said that he has fired a second shot. You can tell they've heard the 911 or they've been told about the 911 because they start focusing on what is on the 911 call. And they knew that he went in to check on Jonathan Latender. He did not voluntarily go in. I mean, voluntarily, yes, but it was not his idea to go check on Jonathan Latender. The officer says, when you went back in to check on this guy, you didn't shoot again? They knew that he told the 911 operator that there was a second shot. They know that he's struggling. That's why they say, traumatic experience. They don't tell him that he's already said that. And they continue to question him as if that doesn't exist, knowing that he's struggling.
Ladies and gentlemen, I have actually gone over the time. I would ask that you take into consideration these circumstances when the judge instructs you on, on the law. And I would suggest to you, ladies and gentlemen, that Brian Camp was, it was appropriate for him to use, well, know that he was going to die. And it was appropriate for him to use under the circumstances, under all of the circumstances and the same circumstances of a reasonable person. The judge is going to tell you the Commonwealth has to prove four things didn't happen. They're not going to be able to do that because this was, under all of the circumstances, ladies and gentlemen, an appropriate use of deadly force. And I ask that you find Mr. Camp not guilty.